The Terrible Two by Mac Barnett and Jory John. Illustrated by Kevin Cornell. Read by Miss Claybaugh. Chapter 25. Holly and Miles stopped in front of Miles's new locker, number 336. Stuart was entering the combination to the locker below, which was Miles's old locker, number 337. Hey, said Holly, when did you get an upper locker? We traded, Stuart announced. Why would anyone trade? Behind Stuart's crouching back, Miles cut Holly off by sawing silently at his neck. I know, Stuart said. Why would anyone want an upper locker? Holly arched an eyebrow. Everyone wanted an upper locker. Miles wanted an upper locker. And in pretty much the only highlight of the last month or so, he'd tricked Stuart into giving his up. It was your standard Tom Sawyering. Before lunch one Tuesday, Miles had kneeled in front of his locker and pulled a coin from his pocket. Hey, look at that, Miles said. A quarter. What? said Stuart. You just found a quarter? Oh yeah, look at that. It's a bicentennial quarter. Miles held up the quarter and showed Stuart the drumming man on the back. Wow, aren't those quarters worth even more than normal quarters? Yeah, said Miles. About two dollars, I think. Stuart just looked at the quarter and gasped. I find stuff like this on the floor all the time, Miles said. People are always dropping stuff. One reason I love having a lower locker. What do you mean, one reason? Well, you don't have to lift your books into your locker this way. That can lead to injury, you know, sort of an achy tingling running through your forearm. My forearm has been aching. Stuart said. Is that bad? Could be. Could be tendonitis or carpal tunnel. Oh, man. You probably don't have carpal tunnel. Miles has pocketed the quarter, but you never know. Stuart was looking a little nervous. Time to clinch it. Plus, a lower locker keeps your lunch fresh and cool. You know, because heat rises. I wish I had a lower locker. Whoa, Stuart, whoa. I'm not going to trade with you. Please trade with me. No way, it's not an even trade. I love my lower locker. Please? Maybe... Miles started. No. What? Well, I was going to say, maybe if you gave me your fruit snacks for a week. But what about a month? And that's how Miles got an upper locker. He looked forward to telling the story to Holly as soon as Stuart left, but Stuart was having trouble with the combination. Um, Miles, said Stuart, what was the last number again? Thirteen. Oh, yeah. Stuart turned the dial to the left. The metal door swung open. I don't remember any of this, Stuart said. There was a springing sound and a muffled oof from Stuart as a pie flew from his locker and into his face. This is what Mile this is what Stuart saw in his locker. The amazing locker pult. A catapult for pies. What? The what? The what? Stuart pulled the aluminum pie tin from his face and began to wipe off whipped cream. That was crazy. Miles bent down and peered into Stuart's locker. The catapult was impressive. Brilliant even. The whole prank combined classic styling, a good old pie in the face, with an innovative pie delivery system. Only Niall Sparks could have dreamed up the contraption in Locker 337. But there was one problem. Niall Sparks had gotten the wrong locker. Ha ha, Miles said. He actually said ha ha. He didn't know we switched. Niles hadn't known about the locker switch. He'd been too busy planning and building and smiling, and he'd missed a crucial detail. Here was a little pranking rule for Niles Sparks. Don't miss crucial details. After a long streak of thwarted pranks, Miles was now the thwarter. He'd thwarted Niles, just as Niles had thwarted him. Well, technically he'd benefited from an oversight. It wasn't exactly an active thwarting. But a thwart was a thwart. 
Stuart picked off a maraschino cherry stuck above his left eyebrow and popped it in his mouth. Yum! It's like a Shirley Temple! Miles felt a pang of sympathy for Stuart. Collateral damage in the prank war. But then he seemed to be enjoying that cherry. The commotion attracted a crowd, and the crowd attracted Barkin. Make way for me! Make way for me! Barkin said. He plowed through the mob, surveyed the situation. Stuart, covered in whipped cream. Miles, nearby, himself on the case. Stuart, said Barkin, you're covered in whipped cream. I know, said Stuart. There's a pie-flinging machine in my locker. Is there really? asked Barkin, getting purplish. He examined the inside of Stuart's locker. My, my, Barry, the principal muttered to himself, a catapult. He pulled a pair of latex gloves from his principal pack. Let's look for clues, shall we? Miles already knew what Barkin would find. Nothing. Niles made have may have made one mistake, but he wasn't going to make two. Nothing, Barkin said, after some careful poking and prodding, but the investigation will continue. Miles pretended Barkin wasn't staring right at him. Barkin continued to stare right at him. The bell rang. Principal Barkin snapped to the to purple-faced attention. Get to class, everybody. That bell means you're late. Don't think I will hesitate to give 62 to students' detentions at once. I would welcome the chance to hold that world record. As the crowd dispersed, Miles glimpsed Niles looking on. Niles looked lost, dismayed, thwarted. And for the first time in three weeks, Miles was the one smiling. He grinned at Niles and went to his locker, his upper locker, to grab his math book. Maybe he would have pizza for lunch today. Yes, that sounded good. He swung open his locker door. Look at all those cherries, Stuart said. It's like your locker is a Shirley Temple factory. Miles hoped Barkin wasn't still staring right at him. He was. I didn't do it said Miles. Strike three, said Principal Barkin. Chapter 26 Principal Barkin was relaxed. He sat back in his chair. His face was not purple or even a deep red. It was face-colored. Miles took this as a very bad sign. I think maybe I was framed, Miles said. You were framed, said Barkin. And who, Miles Murphy, would frame you? He couldn't rat. Lots of people? Lots of people? Miles Murphy, I don't doubt that lots of people dislike you, but that is because you are a prankster, and now you have just pulled another prank. I didn't do it, said Miles. And how do you explain the evidence? A coincidence? Yes, of course, a coincidence. You had a locker full of whipped cream and cherries on the same day that Stuart got a face full of whipped cream and cherries. Quite a coincidence. And Stuart's locker, of course, until Tuesday, was your locker, meaning you had the combination. So it's really two coincidences. With all these coincidences, Miles Murphy, I suggest you'd hurry out and buy a lottery ticket except for one thing. Today is your unlucky day. Miles slouched. Another reason I would not suggest you buy a lottery ticket, Barkin continued, is that it is illegal for a kid to buy a lottery ticket, so I'd never suggest it. Not that the law ever stopped Miles Murphy. It is also illegal for a kid to drive, and even more illegal for a kid to drive my car, and probably also illegal to park a car at the top of the steps of the school, which I still don't understand how you did. I didn't, Miles said. Barkin chuckled. Never in all my years as principal has a car blocked the entrance to the school. Never has a swarm of crickets descended on a classroom full of good students, including my son, Josh, who is a great student. Never have I come across a locker booby-trapped with a pie catapult. And you know what else I'd never seen before this year? Barkin extended a surprisingly long index finger. You, Miles Murphy, now tell me. Is that just another coincidence? Yes, 
Miles said. Miles Murphy, do not interrupt me. That was a rhetorical question. Don't you even know what a rhetorical question is? M Miles didn't know whether to answer. Barkin looked at him expectantly. Yes? Miles said. That was a trick question, Barkin said. You were doomed whether you answered it or not. A classic Barkin trap. Miles winced. Outside, in the distance, a cow mood. Don't you see, Miles Murphy? You can't win. In fact, you've already lost. The game was over the second you decided to take on a Barkin. The principal pushed back his chair and leapt onto his maroon rug. The Barkins have been principals at Yawnee Valley for five generations. Right now, it's not just me bearing down on you, Miles Murphy. You are feeling the full weight of history on your shoulders. Tango with one Barkin, and you tango with all of us. Principal Barkin gestured at a wall full of portraits in chintzy frames. There are only four, Miles said. What? There are only four portraits. You said there were five generations of Barkin principals. Yes, well, my grandfather's portrait was removed. For a moment, Principal Barkin lost his momentum. Grandpa Jimmy had been a good man. He always making silver dollars appear from behind little Barry's ears. He did the trick every Thanksgiving, the only time Barry's father let Grandpa Jimmy visit. What's that, some dirt behind your ears? Grandpa Jimmy would say. Then, reaching forward, ta-da, a silver coin would appear between his grandfather's fingers. And that wasn't even the best part. After a ten-minute speech about the serious, real-world importance of behind-the-ear hygiene, emphasizing both cleaning philosophy and technique, Grandpa Jimmy would give Barry the coin, as long as he promised to deposit it in his federally insured Little Savers College savings account. Compound interest! Jimmy would say. That's the real magic trick. But Grandpa Jimmy had been soft. He'd canceled school in the blizzard of 32, besmirching Yawnee Valley's otherwise perfect school operations record. Principal Barkin remembered the day his father, former Principal Barkin, then just Principal Barkin, took over this office. Take it down, Bertrand Barkin had said. Those were his first official words of principalship. And so Bert, the janitor, had removed the portrait of James Jimmy Barkin from the wall. After school, on the way to his dad's car, Barry saw the painting, its frame cracked, leaning against a green dumpster. He thought about sneaking it home, disobeying his father, stuffing it in the trunk, smuggling it up to his room at night, and hiding it in the closet behind his blazers. But he hadn't. Maybe he should have. No. Surely Barry Barkin had made the right choice that day, just as Bertrand had been right to take the portrait down, because a principal's authority must be absolute. There was no room for weakness. Principal Barkin's eyes refocused. Detention! After school and before school, every day until you leave this school. Miles sank.